Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. My name's Matt, and today we're going to take a look at a prototype Select Fire M1 Garand, developed by Winchester. This rifle dates back to the late 40s, and is chambered in one of the early iterations of the T65 30 calibre light rifle round, which would eventually be adopted as 762 by 51 Very little information is available about the rifle, but it's believed to have been developed by Winchester engineer Harry H. Seafried. We've seen some of his work before when we took a look at the Winchester self-loader rechambered in 45 ACP. The Cody Firearms Museum's former curator, Herb Howes, credited Seafried with the rifle, which he described as an adaptation of the M1 into a squad automatic rifle. Our friend Ian over at Forgotten Weapons has also examined the rifle in the past and did a good job at showing its internals. After some archival research, and combing Winchester's patents from the period, we can now shed a little more light on the rifle's history. Externally, the rifle has a number of instantly recognisable distinctions from the standard M1. It has a reshaped stock with an added pistol grip and a proprietary box magazine, as well as a combined bipod and conical flash hider. If we look closer, we'll notice that the stock has a swell just ahead of the breech, flowing out into an almost triangular bulge. These changes to the stock also distinguish this rifle from Winchester's other Select Fire M1 adaptations, which retain the Garand's standard stock profile. It would seem that these changes to the ergonomics of the weapon have been made in an effort to make it more controllable during automatic fire. We can't rely on patents to tell the whole story of this rifle, however, as many of the elements that make up the weapon appear to have gone unpatented. But from the available patents, and with an examination of the rifle we can learn a lot. The substantial external and internal changes made to the rifle suggest that this was not an attempt to adapt the M1 with a minimal number of component part changes, but rather an effort to generally improve the rifle, making it more conducive to fully automatic fire. In the summer of 1944, Winchester's CEO, Edwin Pugsley, directed Seafried to begin work on a select fire conversion of the M1 to rival those being developed by Springfield Armoury and Remington. Winchester's Select Fire Grand went through a number of iterations, which resulted in two patents from Seafried. The first of these was filed in August 1944. It incorporated an elongated sear actuating lever and a selector on the lower right side of the receiver. Winchester's first attempts at a Select Fire M1 conversion resulted in rifles with extremely high, uncontrollable rates of fire in excess of 900 rounds per minute. Winchester's work on the Select Fire adaptation came to a halt at the end of the war. It appears, however, that Winchester again began to work on adapting the M1 in the late 1940s, with Seafried again working on the project. Seafried filed a second patent in January 1948, which used a catch to hook the sear. The rifle we're examining here appears to have yet another Select Fire system. One that so far I've not been able to find a patent for. The rifle's receiver was originally manufactured as a standard Winchester made 30 odd 6 M1 with a serial number of 1,627,456. This means it was a wartime production rifle dating from May 1945. It would appear that rather than the rifle being lifted from the rack finished, it seems to have been earmarked for prototype development because the receiver forging lacks the cuts needed for the on-block clip release lever. This makes sense if it was known that the receiver was destined to be used as a prototype, which fed from a box magazine. However, the timeline for the rifle gets more complex when we consider that it was a late war production rifle. The rifle may have simply been set aside for internal prototype work in May 1945, and not used until the T-65 chambered rifle was developed. Alternatively, it's possible the rifle was converted during the initial attempts to create a Select Fire M1, but was later rechambered from 30 6 to the new T65 round. Right then, let's take a closer look at some of the rifle's features. The trigger guard assembly, which also comprises the magazine well floor plate, is a self contained assembly and doesn't interact with the weapon's trigger mechanism or the action itself. While Seafried had a patent, for his own magazine system, this rifle uses a slightly different mag release and floor plate. 
It's actually more similar to one seen in Stefan Janssen's 1956 patent for a stripper clip loading box magazine for the M1. The magazine used in this prototype, however, is not the same as Janssen's. The magazine release is at the front of the magazine well. Here we can see the magazine's anti-tilt follower tab, which travels inside the channel projecting from the rear of the mag. Unlike earlier Winchester select fire conversions, this rifle feeds from a proprietary magazine designed to feed the T65 round, rather than one based on the BAR's mag. The magazine may well have been built later when experimenting with the new cartridge. And it doesn't appear to closely follow the pattern used by Winchester on several other designs during the period. As I mentioned earlier, the rifle doesn't appear to use the select fire system seen in either of Seafried's earlier patents. The safety selector is located on the left side of the receiver, forward in line with the breech. It has two positions, with an arc of 90 degrees between the two. This position doesn't match Seafried's patents for select fire conversion, however it does match the position patented by David Marshall Williams but it doesn't share the Williams selector's orientation of travel. So far I've been unable to find a pattern that matches the rifle's selector position or method of fully automatic conversion. The pistol grip is an interesting addition as well, as none of the earlier Winchester select fire prototypes, nor the original select fire prototypes from Springfield incorporated one. Visually it's actually quite similar to those seen on the later Italian Beretta BM59 Mark IIs. It appears that there's been a number of efforts to lighten the rifle. Externally, the prototype has an aluminium butt plate, while internally there is milling at the bottom of the barrel flat, and this not only has the effect of lightening the rifle, but also allows a new, straight operating rod to travel rearwards under the barrel. How this impacted the barrel's harmonics is unclear. The removal of the Garand's original magazine, an on-block clip system, also helps to lighten the prototype. Sadly, I didn't have a chance to strip the rifle down, but the rifle certainly feels lighter and handier than you would normally expect. Its weight's estimated to be around 8 pounds, which is significantly lighter than a stock Garand, which is at around 10.5 pounds, and lighter than the later T44E4, which became the M14. The T44E4 weighed in at around 8.9 pounds. The bipod patented by Seafried in April 1945 comprises a pair of tube steel legs, which have a set height, and a conical aluminium flash hider. The legs are spring-loaded, and the entire assembly attaches via a latch, which seats over the rifle's bayonet lug. The bipod is the only element of the rifle which can be attributed directly to Seafried, and by the bipod's very nature of attachment, may have simply just been attached later. The prototype appears to be chambered in an iteration of the 30 light rifle round, which later became known as the T65. The rechambering was achieved by installing a metal block, which shortened the magazine well. The magazine release is at the front of the magazine well, and also had a slot into which the follower tab housing on the mag could slide into. The development of the 30 light rifle round, which eventually became 762 by 51 began in 1944, with the round being referred to as the T-65 in 1946. It appears that the rifle is chambered in a version of the T-65 cartridge, but which iteration is unclear. However, its chambering does support the theory that the prototype may date from around 1947-48. The T-65 didn't take on the now standard 762 by 51 mm dimensions until 1949 in the form of the T65E3 round, but without a chamber casting it's impossible to know what this rifle's exact chambering is. While Winchester continued to work on adapting the M1 Garand into a select fire rifle, none of their rifles were seriously considered by US ordnance. At the same time, John Garand was also working on his own series of select fire magazine-fed prototypes, the T20 series, at Springfield. While Remington had also been awarded a contract to develop a similar rifle, tested under the designation T-22. These projects subsequently gave way to a number of other designs, all chambered in the T-65 round, including the T-25-47, the T-44 and the T-48. 
These were all tested before the Garand-influenced T-44 was eventually selected in 1957, becoming the M14. Thanks for watching guys, thanks to Nate for some of the rifle rack weight data used in this episode, and of course to the Cody Firearms Museum for allowing us to examine this unique prototype. I can't recommend the newly refurbished museum enough. If you enjoyed the video, please like, share and subscribe if you haven't already. If you're enjoying our videos, please consider supporting us over on Patreon. We have some cool perks, and even just a dollar really helps. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.